So different civilizations, different peaks, basically the, the west is going down, invaded by the barbarians, it's really very little, even, even when the Franks eventually created the Holy Roman Empire, it's almost like a joke at the beginning, it's a, still a very relatively small area, France and a little bit of Germany, and that, that never was a rich area, so they are in control of a relatively poor area at that point. Italy is a mess, we remain a mess <coughs> for a long time. Uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, survives, but is struggling. Um, the Arab civilization came out of nowhere, it's become a big civilization. At one point it's the best of the best, uh, then it fragments, then it is invaded by the Mongols. It will come back after the Mongols and, uh, and still, uh, uh, still be one, the main one, <coughs> until recently, really. And if you think of it, at the end of World War II, we forget, at the end of World War II, which is 70 years ago, uh, the richest part of the world was the West, but the Eastern Europe, Russia were very poor, uh, China was starving, India was starving, Latin America was starving, the second richest area was really the, the, the Arab world. And, you know, so. <coughs> it declined, but you know, the, the big decline is actually very recent. Um, and then you have China with the song, it's also a uh, major civilization. And then the, the, the Islamic world and the Chinese world have the huge impact of the Mongols. Um, India is, is becoming a little Muslim, and Europe is an incredible mess. Right? Nobody knows how many states existed during the Middle Ages. You know, Italy in particular, he has shown as one thing, but actually many small towns were independent. They had their own uh, prince and you know, they fought each other and was uh, endemic warfare. You know? Not only the, the Roman unity had collapsed, but this went even beyond what was before Rome. There was just no major, uh, uh, no stability really, no stability. <coughs> Um, nonetheless, during this period, which was you know, obviously a bleak period from the point of view of writing, of uh, science, of uh, uh, philosophy, <coughs> a number of revolutions happened, uh, for better or for worse. The most famous is, is uh, the political revolution, feudalism. It starts in France with the idea that the king uh, delegates others to rule their lands and in return expects uh, money and uh, soldiers when there's a war. And it's a strange system that has a central authority but that central authority actually does not really control the territory. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixed, uh, it's a strange world where it's not clear how much power the king has, uh, it's not clear how much power the vassal has. It's not, in fact, it's not clear where the border is, because some of these people had dubious alliances to their king. Uh, the commercial revolution uh, <clears throat> is also important. With the Roman Empire, there was free trade, it was easy to trade, and so on. Uh, in this big, messy Europe, it becomes extremely dangerous to travel. And so what that, that creates, that has two effects. Uh, one is the idea that you enclose a territory and that becomes a sort of a cooperative system where we live there, there is a, a, a lord of this place, probably a castle, something to protect and the people inside have an, a, a, a self-sufficient economy <coughs> and that creates its own system which is kind of new uh, and and the other thing is, trade does exist. It's more limited, but it does exist. And exists in places that are easy to reach and safe to reach, and those become market towns. And the markets in the Middle Ages become very important. You basically venture out of the walls of your place only to go to the market and then come back. And those market fairs would not be a, a, an afternoon. It would be multi-day events where lots of, lots of people would converge. Most famous were the ones 
in, uh, in France. Then the other thing that happens <coughs> is that the power of the monasteries increases. Now that's kind of intriguing. Uh, you, you, you have an official church in Rome, and the, in general it is a, its power is ascending. It's, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more political, and the church has some terrific ideas, like becoming the one that decides if you are a king or not. You know, all the, all the people of the East, East Europe, North Europe, if you want to be recognized as a king by everybody, you have to ask me, the Pope, to crown you. you know, it was a great idea. So the political power is ascending. But actually, monasteries uh, <coughs> thrive. And monasteries have been founded originally you know, for really spiritual reasons. If they want to be isolated and just pray. They were the first ones to come up with the, with the hours. You know, 6 a.m. you do this, 7 a.m. you do this. Not no surprising, they were the first ones to adopt uh, you know, ways to uh, calculate time, to keep time. And uh, <coughs> they distributed the labor, so they were almost small. They, they had the most advanced agriculture. They were like a, a small uh, economic revolution itself. And then they prospered. They became bigger and bigger. And through a number of, of, of things, so one was that it was a safe place, it was the least likely place uh, to be uh, destroyed uh, you know, by, by all these uh, hordes roaming the territory. And two, it became tradition that uh, aristocratic families would send one of the children to the monastery. And then, because of the confession, it became almost, almost a tradition that when you're about to die, you have a lot of sins, one way to get away with that would donate to the monastery. Anyway, many of these traditions converged to make the monasteries wealthier and wealthier. And they were just very organized. They, those were also the places where people still knew how to read and write, and they still had a lot of the classics. And monks would spend hours just uh, rewriting, copying manuscripts, you know, especially in Ireland. <coughs> um, <coughs> So there was also an interesting uh, revolution, yeah? I call it the educational revolution, because that's where people still uh, taught uh, elementary things. Not surprisingly, the universities came out of the big cathedrals and the monasteries. And the first universities, the first things you can call universities, where those philosophers came out of actually the religious environment. Of course, in theory, they, their job was to understand uh, to understand the, the, the scriptures, to elaborate on the scriptures, but very rapidly you start seeing uh, speculation, just pure speculation about the world. So we go back to the Greek kind of uh, speculation about the world, you know. And it starts actually in the monasteries and the cathedrals because those were the last places where literacy was valued. <coughs> then, well, military revolution, I don't need to tell you, I mean, Europe learn the gunpowder gun power from the Arabs who learned it from the Chinese. The Chinese used it to do firecrackers and stuff, and the Europeans used it to make war to each other. <coughs> then they built cannons, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger explosive devices. And the cathedrals are pretty obvious. The church started building cathedrals. At the beginning was just to show, probably was just to actually honestly put together people to pray God. But those cathedrals got bigger and bigger, and then they became a um, <clears throat> major place of total art where you had from the guy who does the stained glasses to the guy who designs the musical instrument. You know, you had everybody collaborating to build this amazingly complex system and also the architecture, of course. So a lot of architecture, Gothic and then the Renaissance, uh, is, is, very, is very important. Um, <clears throat> The one that is underestimated is the technological revolution. Uh, this, I don't know if I want to show you the slides, but during the Middle Ages, mostly undocumented, so don't, we don't know who invented it, but a number of things uh, came into, um, uh, became commonplace that will have a huge impact. Think, uh, one of my favorites is the, the reading glasses, the, just glasses, you know? I mean, that sounds trivial. That's, that's when we start seeing them. There's a specific painting in Italy. It was the first one that shows uh, a, a priest with glasses, a pen, a fountain pen, 
and um, the hourglass. That's a revolution. This guy needs to know what time it is back then. Is writing with more than just the traditional uh, tools were, which would not last long. And uh, has glasses. That's a revolution. It means that you can be productive later in life. You know? Somebody at the age of 35, 40 would probably already have trouble doing some of the, of the ordinary work back then. But with the glasses, suddenly you extend everybody's uh, productive life uh, dramatically, especially if you want to read and write. So some of these things became, came out of there. Paper. Paper was, uh, I mean, the Chinese had paper for a long time. Paper comes to Italy, 1200 something, and then Italy becomes a big manufacturer of paper. There would have been no printing press without paper. So there was a major revolution when they started using paper instead of the old uh, parchments, whatever. Besides the fact that it's cheaper, it's uh, faster to make, uh, it's easier to write on it, and so on and so on. Um, okay, I have to read because I don't want to forget some of them. I don't want to read this. I, don't want to read I told you about the one upstairs. <coughs> I want to read this. Okay, golden century. Golden century is when this happens. <coughs> Water and wind, mills. I mean, at one point there's a document in England. I don't remember the name, maybe it's the, where they say there's more than 1,000 windmills. And England was not particularly developed back then. 1,000 windmills. So windmills must have been uh, an ordinary feature of all landscapes in Europe at that point. Well, that's, that's using the energy from the wind. And water winds also became, became commonplace. That's already a mini industrial revolution. Um, <clears throat> You're not using it means you're not just using cheap labor, but you're using natural energy. Okay. Um, water power, wind power. Yeah, pioneered by the monasteries. Always. Iron mills. Oh, that's the book. William the Conqueror's Domesday Book lists five thousand. I was wrong. Five thousand six hundred twenty-five uh, water mills. First paper mill in uh, in Genoa. <coughs> So these things must have been commonplace back then. Um, so water powers, paper making, textile industry, and uh, iron. <coughs> so you have mass, mass production of paper, textile industry is beginning. Uh, iron making is one of the first mass production industries. So that's a mini industrial revolution. If I have a slide of the industrial revolution in England, it would be very similar. So of course, the steam engine makes a difference, right? But it's very similar, actually, in what it causes, what kind of uh, uh, revolution it uh, uh, So, the, well, the catapult, mechanical clock, I told you, spectacles, I told you. And these dates, we don't know we invented them. These dates are the first evidence we have that this exists. So there's one specific painting in Italy, 12. We don't know we invented it or first used it. The clocks are actually extremely complicated mechanism. If you ever go to a clock museum, I highly recommend that you try to figure out how that works. It's made entirely of metal, <coughs> um, well, and uh, it has to be precise. All these clocks and whatever have to work together. So it is a complicated technology. Not surprisingly, a lot of the people who started the Industrial Revolution were clock makers. They were coming from that, uh, from that kind of job. <coughs> Oh, the porta, this is fun. This is a pope where the portable clock uh, required a clock carrier. <clears throat> okay. Clocks, clocks, very important. Age of machines. Trade. I thought I had more on technology. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, so it's not well documented, but actually the golden century, the, the that century, that almost at the end of the Middle Ages, just before the plague, which I assume you know about the Black Death. The plague killed one third of Europe, apparently, at some point. Just, just before that, Europe was coming out of the Dark Ages. You know, at least as far as technology goes, universities, you know, there was a, a, a... And then the Black Death, of course, slowed down the process. But something was happening that was actually pretty interesting. The other thing that was interesting, at the same time, <coughs> Same century was uh, the